I looked down. It was a completely cloudless sky, and way below lay the English countryside, stretching lazily into the distance, a quite extraordinary picture of green and purple in the setting sun. I took a glance at my altimeter. We were at 28,000 feet. At that moment, sheep yelled tally-ho, and dropped down in front of Uncle George in a slow dive in the direction of the approaching plains. Uncle George saw them at once. OK, line astern. I drew in behind Stapney and took a look at them. They were about 2,000 feet below us, which was a pleasant change, but they must have spotted us at the same moment, for they were forming a protective circle, one behind the other, which is a defence formation hard to break. Echelon starboard, came Uncle George's voice. We spread out fanwise to the right. Going down, one after the other, we peeled off in a power dive. I picked out one machine and switched my gun button to fire. At 300 yards I had him in my sights. At 200 I opened up in a long four-second burst and saw the tracer going into his nose. Then I was pulling out so hard that I could feel my eyes dropping through my neck. Coming round in a slow, climbing turn, I saw that we had broken them up. The sky was now a mass of individual dogfights. Several of them had already been knocked down. One, I hoped, was mine, but on pulling up I had not been able to see the result. To my left I saw Peter Pease make a head-on attack on a Messerschmitt. They were headed straight for each other, and it looked as though the fire of both was striking home. Then at the last moment the Messerschmitt pulled up taking Peter's fire full in the belly. It rolled onto its back, yellow flames pouring from the cockpit, and vanished. The next few minutes were typical. First the sky, a bedlam of machines, then suddenly silence, and not a plane to be seen. I noticed then that I was very tired and very hot. The sweat was running down my face in rivulets. But this was no time for vague reflections. Flying around the sky on one's own at that time, was not a healthy course of action. I still had some ammunition left. Having no desire to return to the aerodrome until it had all been used to some good purpose, I took a look around the sky for some friendly fighters. About a mile away over Dungeness I saw a formation of about 40 hurricanes on patrol at 20,000 feet. Feeling that there was safety in numbers, I set off in their direction. When about 200 yards from the rear machine, I looked down and saw 5,000 feet below another formation of 50 machines flying in the same direction. Flying stepped up like this was an old trick of the Huns, and I was glad to see we were adopting the same tactics. But as though hit by a douche of cold water, I suddenly woke up. There were far more machines flying together than we could ever muster over one spot. I took another look at the rear machine in my formation, and sure enough, there was the swastika on its tail. Yet they all seemed quite oblivious of my presence. I had the sun behind me, and a glorious opportunity. Closing in to 150 yards, I let go a three-second burst into the rear machine. It flicked onto its back and spun out of sight. Feeling like an irresponsible schoolboy, who has perpetrated some crime which must inevitably be found out, I glanced round me. Still nobody seemed disturbed. I suppose I could have repeated the performance on the next machine, but I felt that it was inadvisable to tempt Providence too far. I did a quick half-roll and made off home, where I found to my irritation that Raspberry, as usual, had three planes down to my one.